All right. Let's go ahead and come back together. My music stand was stolen, so I don't know where it went. Somebody took it, so I don't have a music stand. So I feel a little naked up here, but here I am. Uh, so uh, what were some places we noticed the law? Lots of opportunities, really, here. But what were some uh, parts of the law maybe that stuck out to us? Pretty obvious, the Ten Commandments were identified very much. So, so the Ten Commandments very much uh, are identified. And we hear them again in Deuteronomy, right? And they're essentially the same. The reason for the Sabbath is a little different. Uh, did you, I don't know if you noticed that in Exodus 20. The reason for the Sabbath is that God created in six days and rested on the seventh. In Deuteronomy, the reason for the Sabbath is you were slaves in Egypt. So now you rest and so do as everybody else in your land, including your slaves, if you have any, on the Sabbath. Yeah, so there's a different reason of it. Yeah, where else did we notice the, uh, the law? Or wonder about the law, maybe. Pretty much all Deuteronomy is about the law. Yeah, in fact, the, the, pretty much all Deuteronomy is about the law. Deuteronomy means second law. That's literally what Deutero is second and namas, nami is law. Uh, it's Moses giving it again. Mm -hmm. uh, 281, at the end of every seven years, you must cancel debts. Oh, yes. Okay. So 281. This is a little beyond our reading, actually. Um, but we heard this also in... Uh, we heard this also in uh, in Leviticus, the uh, uh, Jubilee uh, year, that there's this periodic remission of debts. It's an interesting thing, isn't it? It's not something that has been practiced, uh, maybe not even in those times. Uh, there's debate about whether this was ever actually, like to what extent this was practiced in Israel. It's certainly commanded, but you know, there's the letter of the law and the actual practice of the law are sometimes different things. That, that didn't carry forward. Right, yeah. It didn't carry forward because if you have bankruptcy, you have so many years. It is sort of a bankruptcy idea. Yeah, that's true. I wonder if there's any connection. I don't know where American bankruptcy tradition comes from. I know it's not the same in other Euro in like in European countries, for example. Bankruptcy doesn't operate the same way. Um, I wonder if there's any connection. There might be. I don't know. It's a good, good point. Roman laws or something. Yeah, I don't know. Good. Notice the, the, the effect of that is, for one thing, like if you sell land, this is the Jubilee specifically, they talk about the selling of land, the land returns to its whoever sold it at the end of 50 years. And not 50 years from the sell, but every 50 years the land is supposed to go back to its inheritance. You're never actually selling in the way that we think of like in perpetuity. You're sort of leasing it in a way. Like it belongs to God, you're leasing it, and you can sort of let somebody else use it for the re remainder of the 50-year lease God has given you on it or something like that uh, until everything goes back. But yeah, there's this periodic remission of debts. Good. Where else? What else did we notice in here in the law? Were there troubling things in the law that troubled us? So here are some interesting things, but was, was there a place where you felt uh, a bit uncomfortable about the law? Maybe it was attacking you or you just weren't sure it was right. Some of the animosity <clears throat> that people had for the Jewish people mm. are... I think because they were good money managers and they were probably following their rules. Oh, interesting, yeah. Other people didn't. So talking about, like, in modern times, animosity. Well, even I'm over the last millennia, really. Yeah. This is a long time. But the stereotypes uh, and, um, uh, yeah, I guess hatred of Jews, uh, especially having to do with being money lovers or uh, greedy, but that there was maybe something about good money management that made people around them jealous, uh, well, and, something uh, like that. I think in Germany that was kind of one of the issues. I know in Europe some of the major banking families were Jewish, partly because they couldn't own land, so they couldn't make money in traditional ways. They had to find other ways, yeah. Mm -hmm. They had a system. They had a system, sure, yeah. It seems extreme that they would stone somebody to death for gathering wood on the Sabbath. It does seem extreme that they would stone someone to death for gathering wood on the Sabbath. Yeah. You'll notice a lot of these sort of death penalties for what seem fairly minor things. Uh, there's some debate about to what extent those were followed. Um, there's, I think if you count up carefully, and I might be wrong on this, um, there's like an, one example of the death penalty being carried out for like each of the Ten Commandments, more or less. Um, 
but whether this was actually, to what extent this was practiced beyond that is not clear. So for example, we have a story, we have a few stories, stories of stoning in the New Testament. Uh, but one of them is uh, the woman caught in adultery. Do you remember this story from, uh, I think it's John's gospel, if I remember right. Uh, and uh, they're ready to stone her and Jesus sort of steps in and says, you know, whoever's without sin casts the first stone and nobody ends up doing it. Uh, was that more common than we think? Like to what extent did that was there sort of mercy given in this way? I don't know. It's a good question. Yeah. Um, where, one of the things that bothered me, I guess, is you must destroy all the people the Lord did not yeah. over to you. And it's yeah. kind of repeated over and it over is. again. And mm-hmm. to kill everyone. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, that seems really hard. Yeah, I, so the, the comment of uh, they're being commanded to kill everyone of the people that they're going into the land of. We talked about this a little bit last week. Um, this harem warfare, uh, C-H-E-R-E-M is how you spell it in English. Um, and uh, this is something that's commanded only in this particular instance. So we're going to see it in Joshua when we get to Joshua next week, because Joshua is the story of them actually entering the land. It's also clear that it's not carried out. Um, so at the beginning of Judges, uh, which is the book following Joshua, it's this is the list of all of the nations they didn't drive out. <laughs> you know, So like there's this sort of Joshua's... Joshua is sort of um, idealized in a sense of like, this is you know how how we did it and we drove everybody out and then judges is like this is actually how it was. There's sort of this this um, reflection back and forth. Did you notice the reason why it's given usually that that's the case, uh, why they're supposed to? Well, so they don't rise up against you. Is it how much? Well, that's not the reason that Deuteronomy typically says. Uh, the reason that De- Deuteronomy says it, it's not. So that would be the reason that you would do that as a conquering nation, right? That you would. You don't want them to be able to rise against you. Although usually that means just killing the military males and then enslaving uh, the, the women, children, and the old people. It's, uh, it's because of idolatry. It's saying that if you will live in the land with these people, they will lead you after their gods. Um, and so there's an interest in uh, serving only God, and this is the way it's going to need to happen. Now, I'm not condoning that, right? Um, but that's the reason in Deuteronomy that it's given. And I will say it proves itself out in the sense that in Judges in particular, the consistent story is Israel not following God, turning to the gods of their neighbors. Um, actually, I, I, and, and even, even beyond the time of the Judges, uh, they want a king like the nations around them. They want to be like the nations around them. When they eventually build the temple, the temple looks like the temples of the nations around them. It's the same sort of format uh, that you would expect an ancient Near East temple to look like. Um, So that there's a sense that they are constantly being pulled. And so to what extent is Joshua and then sort of Deuteronomy here too, uh, wishing it was otherwise and sort of trying to bring something reading that back into it or to what extent is it just their failure to do it i I don't know the answer to that but that's i'm glad that you're noticing that wondering about that what about the gospel where did we uh where did we notice the gospel we have a stampede in the kitchen yeah cities of refuge isn't that an interesting thing so um and i don't yeah this uh so did, did you all notice the cities of refuge uh, given to the Levites, I remember right, some of the cities of, of, of the Levites. So uh, there's the uh, Avenger of Blood, right? Is that I think is that how they uh, translate it here, if I remember right? That might be a different translation. But they're, they're, they're fleeing from the Avenger. And what the Avenger is, <laughs> is, uh, what the Avenger is, is if you've heard of uh, honor killings, one second. All right. Hey, you all in the kitchen are really loud. Thank you. All right. Uh, so uh, if, you've, if you've ever heard of cultures where there's like honor killings, for example. So if a member of a family shames the rest of the family, a way of sort of discharging that shame is a, another member of the family will actually kill that person. Or if a family wrongs another family, the way that the shame or the honor is preserved is by taking retaliation on that. So when it talks about the Avenger, that's what it's talking about. It's talking about this sort of informal, you know, extrajudicial, I guess we could say, uh, killing that's just part of the culture. That if, if somebody causes the death of your son, you have the right, and some would say the obligation culturally, to go and 
kill their son, right, to take that back. So the cities of refuge system is set up um, as, a, as, a, as a prevention of that. So in, in the case of accidental killing, not intentional killing, murder is still punishable, right? Uh, in the case of an accidental killing, this person can flee to these cities of refuge and uh, this cultural, um, you know, which is not commanded, this, you know, is not command, this uh, avenger is not something we read in the Law of Moses, it's just something that existed, um, is not allowed to go and, and enact on this. So it's a way of actually curbing. We talked about how some of these laws seem strange to us, but in some ways they are actually ameliorating the practices that are already there or moderating the practices that are already there. Um, this is an example of that, yeah. I don't know if I'd call it quite fully the gospel, but it's the law working more towards justice, maybe would be another way to put it, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where else? Uh, all of the perfect lambs, they were supposed to yeah. sacrifice. A per firstborn perfect lamb, yeah. that's the gospel. Uh -huh. And also Abraham, when he was going to sacrifice Isaac, God provided Isaac. Yeah. And Jesus is referred to as the Lamb of God. So we see this good. So in the sacrificial system, right. the, the sacrificing of firstborn spotless lambs, a firstborn perfect lamb. yeah, is foreshadowing Jesus, actually. And we see Jesus being really picked up this way in uh, the New Testament, in Revelation in particular, uh, John's Gospel also, but the Lamb of God, right? Uh, Revelation has Jesus as a lamb on, on the throne as a slain lamb, which is one of the strangest sort of images, if you can imagine. The king, which is on a throne, which is also a lamb who has been slain. You know, like it's this, it's this, it's this interesting mix, but it's all pull, it's calling back to these things. So we hear, or we kind of see the gospel being um, maybe not directly given, but foreshadowed. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Yeah. What surprised us? in these chapters that we read for Numbers and Deuteronomy for this week? One thing that surprised me is when they were building the uh, ark and God told uh, Moses, use all these instructions that I gave you on the mountain that you wrote down. And mm. I wondered, how did he write those down? And how did he transport them? Well, then in this lesson on page... 258, it says, gave them instructions, take a large stone, cover it with the Oh, stone, yes. And then uh -huh. you could write. I still don't know how to get all that down the mountain. But yeah. Anyway, yeah. answered one question. Yeah, so noticing, and this is actually in the invitation to Deuteronomy here, uh, which I thought was really helpful, that invitation to Deuteronomy, um, where it talks about uh, that they're to take stones and coat them with plaster and then write in the plaster, which is actually was a common, we have a lot of examples of that sort of, uh, of documents, I guess, uh, from that ancient world that are in that way. They're stones that are coated with plaster and then etched in, or with clay, you know, soft clay. I don't know plaster, I don't know the details, but, uh, and then etched in. Um, and so that's a way that they keep these things. Yeah, that is one of the ways that these things are recorded sort of for posterity, yeah. Now, how did Moses remember everything and bring it down the mountain? It's a great question, but yeah. Mm -hmm. What else surprised us? Yeah. Um, kind of related to that, beginning on page 259, where there's that long record of a 40 year journey. Yes. Uh huh. And just every event and name, and, and how, how does someone record all that and remember all that? Yeah, yeah. So, this, this 40 year um, itinerary. Uh, going through the wilderness on page 251. Yeah, how, does, how, do, how do they remember all this? Yeah, you know, I'm, clearly they have record keepers of some kind, right? Um, how that's recorded, I don't know exactly. Um, but uh, yeah, here's all the things that happen. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I wonder too, um, and I, I've mentioned this a little bit, uh, but when we look at texts like this that are, you know, so, so you know, Numbers, for example, the book of Numbers, is not being written as the book of Numbers at the time that it takes place, right? It's not like there's somebody on the side writing this sort of like a court transcriber or something like this. This is put together at a later date at some point. And some of that is, you know, there's, we don't know exactly to what, what, they, what they were using. What did they have in front of them when they put that together? But I can imagine one of those things might have been something very much just like this list of places, 
right? They're like, okay, well, there's this list of places, and you can imagine them sort of as a historian might, looking at this, and they've got all these other stories also that have come down in other forms, orally passed down, or other documents, some of them from Moses himself, perhaps. And they're saying, okay, so this story happens in this place, and we've got this timeline, and so we're going to put it here in the book of Numbers. That there's this sort of, uh, and that's why I say, too, there's, to what extent is some of this being read back into the time from a, you know, a few centuries later, perhaps, and to what extent are things were just like this at the time? Like we talked about all of the sacrifices. Did they have enough animals to do all these sacrifices while they were in the wilderness, eating only manna? Like is that how we're to understand that? Or is that something that's being kind of read back into it by the people uh, a little bit later who are actually putting these things together? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. So it's, it's interesting to think about, although I don't have solid uh, answers to those things. Yeah. What else are we wondering? Or did we did we notice that surprised us? I mean, I guess I was surprised. I didn't realize that Moses never got to go to Jordan. I never. Uh, yeah. You know that through everything that he went, he didn't actually get to yeah. the, to make that final leg of the journey. Moses never actually gets to arrive in the promised land. That's right. Yeah, neither, yeah, Aaron dies before, uh, Miriam dies before, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, he, he makes it to the edge, he gets, and we're, that's our Sunday text this morning, is uh, he gets a, a vision, a view from a top of a mountain, which I kind of imagine must be a sort of a supernatural vision um, uh, of, the, of the land, and, uh, but that he doesn't get to enter it, yeah. No. Did you notice uh, there's, there's uh, a couple different reasons given for why? I don't know if you noticed, there's a difference here between Numbers and Deuteronomy. Um, in Numbers, did you notice why, when God, uh, do you remember when God tells Moses he can't enter the promised land? Do you remember that story? Yeah? Does anybody want to risk it from memory? Because they had um, not followed God. They had not followed his instructions. They being? He and Aaron. He and Aaron, exactly. So Aaron and Moses had not done what God, God told them to bring water out of this rock by commanding it. He says, go in front of all the people, the people don't trust me. Go and just tell the rock uh, to produce water. And Moses goes out, and instead of commanding the rock, he kind of gives this angry speech to the Israelites, and then he hits the rock with his staff, and then water comes out, and God says, Moses, you're not, you're not listening. And it seems like, okay, that's a little strange. In Deuteronomy, several times, uh, he's, remember, this is Moses speaking at the end of his life to the people. He keeps saying, it's your fault that God wouldn't let me go into the land. It's because of you uh, and your unfaithfulness. And it's like, well, I'm, I'm not sure if you're quite right on this, Moses. But this, is, that's, this seems to be Moses' interpretation of, of the events in Deuteronomy, which, again, differ a bit from what we read in Numbers. Uh, but, uh, yeah, he's, he's a little uh, upset at the people, which is there in Numbers, too. I mean, instead of doing what God tells him, he wants to yell at the people for a bit first, yeah. Mm -hmm. And why wouldn't he be? Yeah, why wouldn't he be? I think this came up in uh, uh, maybe in in our Bible study discussion that uh, I can't remember, would it have been uh, a, a real gift to Moses to let him go and continue leading the people in the promised land? Or at the old age of 120, was he ready to retire? Yeah. <laughs> would that have been something of a, of a punishment for him at that point? I don't know the answer to that, but uh, I think at the end of Deuteronomy 34, which is the very last, very end of Deuteronomy, which is our preaching text for this morning, uh, that there is uh, sort of the sense of it's almost a retirement. There's almost a sweetness to the way that God treats Moses uh, when he dies. Yeah. What else surprised us here? Here's a question. Who is Deuteronomy addressed to? Like who, who's the, who are the people that Moses or that the book of Deuteronomy is speaking to as you read it? God's chosen people. So God's chosen people uh, just in general across all time or a specific group? What do you think? I wasn't written to them, do you know? Uh, so, I mean, Deuteronomy is written as a speech from Moses. So in that sense, the speech is delivered, you know, as they're on the entry of the promised land. Uh, when was Deuteronomy put into the form that we have it now? That we don't know. Uh, sometime between that and before the Babylonian exile. So that's a really long range. So somewhere in those like seven centuries uh, or so. Uh, to the Israelites. 
to the Israelites, yeah. To the Israelites, uh, which, which group of Israelites? All of them? One particular generation? I'm asking because this is a fuzzy question that doesn't have really good answers. It says the generation of Israelites who grew up in the wilderness. So the generation who grew up in the wilderness. And yet Deuteronomy will say things like, God made with you a covenant. You heard God's voice at Mount Horeb, which is the other name for Mount Sinai, at Mount Horeb. Uh, and yet and you're like, well, maybe some of them did, but many of them didn't. Uh, there's this sense, and, and then also, God is making this covenant with you, but not just with you, with your ancestors who are after you. So in a sense, there's not one right answer. That's why I asked this question. Deuteronomy has this sort of timelessness to it, where on the one hand, Moses is addressing, you know, in the sort of the first level, Moses is addressing the people who are about to enter the promised land, uh, who none of, none of whom were over the age of 20 when they left Egypt, Right. Because that was the, the, the thing. Everyone who's going to be the, over the age of 20 is going to die in the wilderness. Uh, so you've got some people who, who would remember Egypt, you know, from when they were young. But nobody who was, you know, a full adult by the time of leaving Egypt. And yet Moses speaks to them as though they're exactly the same people as their ancestors were in some cases. In other cases, Moses speaks to them as though, uh, you know, they are sort of standing in for their ancestors in some cases, they're standing in for their descendants who have yet to come, right? That there's this sort of timelessness to the covenant. One of the things Deuteronomy's doing, and one of the ways that it functions is, is it's taking this one-time experience of Israel at Mount Sinai, of this group of tribes in Mount Sinai, and I guess you could almost say generalizing it or making it applicable to the people centuries from now who live under the time of King David or Solomon or who live later than that in the divided kingdom, that there's actually a way in which Deuteronomy is functioning in that. Um, much later, I don't remember when we get to this. Uh, actually, maybe it's not that much later, maybe in December. We might read this in December, I'm trying to remember. Uh, we're gonna read a story of a, uh, a rediscovery of the, uh, of the law. The law is going to be discovered. The priests are renovating the temple after uh, several kings who did not like the temple and let it fall into disrepair. Uh, the, and so they, then a king comes and, and orders some renovations of the temple. And while they're renovating, the priests discover the law. They discover the scroll of the law in the temple that had been lost. And you're like, okay, what is this scroll of the law that they've discovered? Uh, and uh, they, they, they bring it and the king reads it and the king starts to weep and institutes all of these reforms. And it's interesting that the reforms... Uh, echo the concerns of Deuteronomy in particular, actually, uh, more so than, than uh, Leviticus numbers or uh, Exodus Leviticus numbers. And uh, one of the things that you'll notice in Deuteronomy is there's much kind of going forward, not so much as far as we've read now, but what we're going to read in the rest of Deuteronomy. There's this, there's this strong concern for things to be centralized, that there's not supposed to be high places. They're sometimes called these other sort of worship sites on mountains that everything's supposed to happen at the, the place where I will choose to put my name or to put my presence is the way that it's put, um, and which is understood to be Jerusalem, the temple in Jerusalem. Like They're not there yet, but that there's going to be one place, and this is going to be the one and only place where worship is allowed. Well, as we read throughout the time of the kingdoms, typically there were lots of worship places. And it's not until you get to Josiah and this discovery of the uh, scroll of the law in the temple that he finally destroys all the high places and, and gets rid of that and kind of does this centralizing. And, and you say, okay, this is Deuteronomy. Now there's speculation that, okay, did the priests discover a scroll of the law and sort of say, oh, actually, here's what it is. That's, some people have made that argument. Uh, was Deuteronomy hidden because there was a series of kings who were hostile uh, to worship of, of the God of Israel? And uh, so the priests, some priests had sort of hidden it to keep it safe, perhaps something like that. Um, but there's in numbers in Le, or Exodus Leviticus numbers, there's not as much as a concern for this sort of um, centralizing. Whereas Deuteronomy, especially as we get a little further, is going to be very clear. Like all the all the worship must happen here. That becomes very important when the kingdoms split because Jerusalem's only in one of the kingdoms, and so the northern kingdom sets up all of these different worship spots because they don't want their people, you know, having to travel to a neighboring somewhat kind of a rival kingdom to go and do their worship. They want to keep them where they are. Uh, and, but, so Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy becomes important in that way. Um, even by the time of the Samaritans, uh, by, of Jesus, you have the Samaritans who uh, worship 
in a different way than the Jews do in Jerusalem. Samaritans are descendants of, in part anyways, of the northern kingdom of Israel. They're Israelites, um, sort of half Israelites in some ways, but they're descendants from many of those tribes. And they worship on Mount Gerizim. You remember this conversation that Jesus has with the woman at the well in John chapter 4? Uh, uh, you know, you worship on, on this mountain and you Jews worship in Jerusalem, on Mount Zion in Jerusalem where the temple is. Uh, and uh, Jesus' response ends up being, well, the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers of God will worship God, not on this mountain or at the temple, but in spirit and truth is what Jesus responds. That there's this sort of change that comes along. Uh, but that's something to notice in Deuteronomy is, is Deuteronomy addressed to, in some ways, a situation that isn't there yet. Like it's addressed to a problem that doesn't exist yet at the time that Moses is speaking on the edge of the wilderness, but it will exist. You know, what's all, what do we do with all of these sort of different worship sites that sometimes are, you know, to Yahweh, the God of Israel, sometimes are to Yahweh and some other gods mixed in there. Uh, we have a archeological thing of a, uh, uh, a little piece that says uh, it's dedicated to Yahweh and his Asherah. Asherah is a fe feminine god, uh, a Canaanite god, that there was sort of this picture of Yahweh being married to one of the Canaanite gods that somebody was worshiping. You know, that there was all of these sort of mixings that was happening in all of these um, outer ways and this idea that there needed to be some kind of purification of worship that happened centrally at the temple. So all that to say it's complicated. Yeah. There are quite a few mentions of the Asherah and yes. Other yep. I didn't know what that so yeah, that's what the Asherah Asherah is one of the. Uh, so the Canaanites, uh, there's a Canaanite pantheon that sort of is similar to the Greek pantheons. We know about Greek gods Zeus and Zeus's wife Hera, and you know all of those, you know uh, Ares and Hades and all of them. Uh, the Canaanites have very have have their own pantheon that mirrors that in some way. So. Um, there's uh, typically uh, one of the, the chief god would be was called El, uh, which is literally kind of just a generic word for God in Hebrew. Um, and El was married to Asherah. Uh, so you have these two kind of top gods. One of El's sons was Baal. Now over time, as we can see from archaeological evidence, Baal sort of supplants El, and be Baal becomes sort of the main god that's worshipped throughout Canaan. And we see that a lot. We saw that in Numbers, the Baal Peor. Uh, incident, you remember that? So there's this Baal of Peor. What's that? Didn't Baal have an Asherah? Because yes, and so and so Baal kind of supplants El and becomes Baal and Asherah together. Yes, exactly. But that's always a bad thing for. Us. Yeah, well, it's 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 a worship of these pagan gods, and there's, so there's different sort of local traditions of it. Sort sort of in the Greek, um, you know, if you know much about Greek mythology. There's a lot of conflicting stories, right? Because there were a lot of different locations that would tell different stories about Zeus and Hera and whatever. And they don't all line up. And they're sort of not meant to. Um, and the Canaanites had something similar. So there's a, there's a god of death in the Canaanites. Mot is the god of death. There's a god of the sea of chaos, so Yom. So these are kind of equivalents to Hades and Poseidon in Greek mythology. So all of that existed in, in and around there. Uh, we've actually found temples to Baal in Rome and uh, Greece. Um, so like Baal worship, you know, these, these cultures that live next to each other would sort of trade gods <laughs> back and forth in some ways, you know, and so uh, this group here, and Baal was understood to be sort of a storm god. So think Zeus with the lightning bolt. You, we have imagery of Baal as the giver of lightning, like that there's this sort of um, similar uh, Baal thought. Baal a cow? Baal was thought to ride a cow. Pardon? To ride a cow. Baal would ride a cow. That was Baal's mount. So, so when they build the golden calf, they're building a mount of Baal. They're not building Baal himself. They're building the animal Baal likes to ride, if, if that makes sense. They're making a throne for Baal is another way of thinking about it. Yeah. Um, and they're thinking Baal is Yahweh, right? They're not, they, they are not, when in the golden calf incident, Exodus 32, they're not turning their back on Yahweh who has delivered them from Egypt. They are building a calf and saying, this is the God who brought us out of Egypt. We don't know what this whole Yahweh thing is. Maybe it was a disguise, a fake name. But we're figuring out now that really it's this Baal character who we've heard is very powerful. And look, there's lightning and fire and clouds. This sounds like Baal. We're going to do what we know or we've heard 
uh, Baal likes and make a throne for Baal, this golden calf thing. So in some ways, when we think of idolatry, it's not so much that they're rejecting one God in favor of another. It's that they are confusing who this God is for all of the other stories about gods around them. Uh, I think that's helpful for us because typically in our time, idolatry is not us rejecting one God in favor of another. It's us uh, putting other things in the place of that God, like things that aren't religious, like uh, one of the, the most common idol, according to Jesus, wealth, right? Uh, mammon, so he uh, uses the Aramaic word for it. Uh, you cannot serve both God and wealth, that we put our money or our property, our possessions in the place of God, or we sort of interpret God as being the same as our possessions in some way. Uh, sometimes this happened really explicitly. There's theologies where, um, if you've ever heard of prosperity gospel, the theology is basically, if you, are, uh, if you are pleasing God, if God is pleased with you, you will have wealth and things will go well for you and you'll fly private jets and you'll have all of these things. And, that's, and there are people who, who teach that, who teach that very explicitly and make a lot of money doing it. Um, that's idolatry. Even though they're using the same name for God, they're quoting the Bible in you know, less responsible ways, but they're quoting the Bible. That's idolatry. You are saying God is something other than God is, right? Um, well, they couldn't see God ever. And so yeah. they probably were attracted to something that mm. they could see. I think that's good. So they couldn't see God, and so they were attracted to things that they could see. Or or yeah. or something. One of the things they that's... talk about uh, the devoted things that someone yeah. took, those are... Yeah, so things that, yeah, so they'd have these idols, these images to worship. Judaism uh, is, or the, it's not right to quite call it Judaism is. Judea, Judaism comes from Judah, the tribe of Judah. And at this point, there are 12 tribes, so it's not right, quite right to call them Jews yet. But the Israelites and the, and the religion of Israel is unique in the area because of its very strong prohibition of images. They're not, they're not supposed to build anything that looks like humans, that looks like animals. And it's not even clear that you're not, not supposed to build them for worship. Like you're just sort of not supposed to have them at all because the temptation is so strong to worship them because that's what everybody does. Everybody has these little statues that are objects of worship um, and or images or something like that. And they're just not supposed to have it at all, except they have them on the Ark of the Covenant. We talked about cherubim, I think. Uh, oh, I talked about this with Bible study. Uh, so the, the Ark of the Covenant has cherubim on it. You remember that? Does anybody know what a cherub is? Well, you told us. I told you in Bible study. So anybody who's not Joanne? Okay. <laughs> when you hear a cherub, what do you think of? Angel. Think of an angel? What does that angel look like? A child. A child, baby with wings, usually yeah. naked. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh-huh. Yeah, so... That is not what a cherub is in the ancient Near East. Uh, a cherub is a, uh, uh, an, a pretty good example of a cherub would be a sphinx. So you know the sphinx statue? There are these composite animals. They don't always look the same. Composite animals, they do have wings. Um, or like a griffin, you know, so kind of a lion and an eagle mixed together, something like that, which is a Greek uh, mythology idea. But that's what, the, when it talks about cherub or the cherubim, uh, karovim in Hebrew, that's what it's talking about. So on top of the Ark of the Covenant are not babies with wings. They are, on top of the Ark of the Covenant are these imposing looking powerful uh, animals with wings, these sort of mythological animals that, by the way, the Ten Commandments prohibit them from making. They're not, they're not supposed to make these, but God says you can make them here. Again, this, this, so there's this pattern of God uh, being outside of the law, the commandments that God is giving to the Israelites. Um, that, you know, the, the priest can have, the priest's robes are to be made of mixed materials, which is not kosher. They're not supposed, you're not supposed to wear things made of mixed materials. But for God, God can do that. And God actually commands that for the priest, for example. God commands these images of these composite animals to be placed on the ark. And the idea is that God is enthroned above the cherubim's wings. So I'm not sure exactly what that looked like, but that there's sort of this space and God is invisibly present above that. And so at Yom Kippur, uh, Day of Atonement, the priest goes in, um, takes a little bit of uh, the blood from uh, the, I can't remember if it's a bull or a goat or a lamb, whatever the sacrifice is for that one specifically, and uh, splashes it there and makes atonement where God is. Uh, so so uh, uh, sometimes, have you ever heard this term mercy seat uh, as a, as a uh, translation for this place 
uh, above the ark where God is, is the seat of God's mercy. It's where God is enthroned and gives mercy, gives forgiveness. Uh, the book of Hebrews in the New Testament makes a lot of this imagery. Uh, Paul does a little bit in Romans too, um, that Jesus is the, uh, in Greek, hilasterion, but uh, a translation of that is mercy seat. Jesus is now the place of atonement, the place of mercy uh, for us, um, uh, Paul says in Romans. So um, I don't remember how we got onto that, but yeah, so cherubs. So it's a very different idea than you think. Um, they, when you look at pictures of them, they, look, they kind of remind you of things you might see like in Egyptian art, for example, of ancient Egyptian, if you kind of think about that. Um, seraphs, that's the other angels we hear about in, English, in, uh, in uh, the Bible. Seraphim are um, also sort of terrifying, but they fly and they have six wings. And angels in general in the Bible don't look anything like we think of angels, right? So our sort of picture of angels as humans with wings, uh, angels either look like humans, and are sort of indistinguishable from them. Or they look like these cherubs, which aren't, they're not angels exactly, they don't ever speak, but they're sort of the guard dogs. And then, or they're the seraphim that Isaiah has in this temple, this vision of uh, the, the seraphim who are covering their faces and their feet and flying with their, uh, with their wings and sort of crying out, holy, 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 right? We, we sing that uh, every Sunday, for example. Um, so, you have to get into a, a different mindset than sort of the, I don't know if it's medieval or whatever, the art tradition we have that's just different uh, from what, what these people had. Yeah. Uh, what other questions, what other wonderings do we have? I, I just got to say, I don't know how Moses kind of held it together right before they were going into Jordan, because I can imagine like he knows he doesn't get to make this trip, and then he's mm -hmm. got these two and a half tribes that come to him, and he's like, here we go again. Yeah, you know? right. Oh, good. You're, you're not listening. Yeah. And I just, you know, I can only imagine what that must have felt like. Exhausting. Yeah. Um, but then but then to take the time and hear their plan. Yeah. Um, and God was good with it. Yeah. Yeah, how did Moses hold it together when all this happened? So, yeah, the... Uh, uh, the example you're bringing up is, I can't remember which tribes it's they are. Do you, and... Is it Dan? No, it's not Dan, is it? But Reuben. Reuben and a couple other tribes, they're like, we actually really like this land on this side of the Jordan River. Uh, could we have this land instead of getting some of the land on the other side of the Jordan River? And Moses is like, you just want to get out of the work of taking the land and say, you know, you're going to send everybody else. So, no, we'll just, you know, we'll have our wives and our children will stay here in this and then we'll go over and we'll fight and then we'll come back. And so they sort of make this plan. But Moses is like, really? You're, you're, you're chickening out now? We just did this 40 years ago, right? You know, we've been wandering in the wilderness because you were afraid to go then and now you're afraid again. Yeah. How does Moses hold it together? Another thing that's interesting to notice, I think, in the last part of Numbers is there's several exceptions to the law given. Did you notice that? Where people come up, so the daughters of, I think it's Zelophadad, for example, right? You remember that story? Of uh, there, there, there are no male heirs in their family, essentially. And so the way the inheritance law goes, whoever they marry, which has to be somebody from another clan, um, that land's, their ancestral land's going to go to, you know, whoever they marry, that whatever clan they marry into. And so an exception has to be made where, okay, the daughters will be considered male heirs for this. You know, like that there's sort of these exceptions. And it's interesting that we see that in numbers already that, you know, sometimes we think of, of the law as God gives it as being this sort of um, eternal, unchangeable, perfect, once for all thing. But it's actually given to specific people in specific times and places and needs to be worked in that situation. Now, there's parts of the law that are, um, I don't think any part of the law is truly eternal. It's more eternal than we are, so it's practically eternal, but... Uh, but, uh, but there are parts that are, you know, the 10 commandments is probably the best example of like, here's the 10 commandments, which do apply even on us today, not because Moses gave them, uh, specifically, but because Jesus continues to preach them, right? That they come through Jesus and that they're reflections of what we'd call natural law, that there's an order to creation to the way that the world works. Um, and that this, the 10 commandments are part of that, but the kosher laws, uh, you know, so we eat, uh, uh, we eat seafood that we ought not to eat according to uh, Leviticus in particular, right? There's lots of shellfish that are not allowed. Uh, those are not eternal 
for once and for all law for all people. This isn't sort of a universal, this is the way, you know, the truly good of the universe or something like that. No, the law is particular. It's given to particular people in particular times for particular reasons. Um, and the insight of Paul in the New Testament in particular is that the law is not given for salvation. That's the constant thing we want. We want to say, okay, here's the law that applies in all times and places. And if we follow that, that's what makes us good or right with God or saved or, or whatever language we use or on the right side of history, right? You know, there's, there's non-theistic ways of doing this. And the point is that actually, no, God does not save that way. God does not save through the law. Um, and Paul's point is it's always been this way. Abraham was not saved by obedience to the law, which by the way, hadn't been given yet. Uh, he was saved by trusting in a promise. He believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Genesis, uh, was that 12, 15, I think. Um, and uh, that there's this different way of understanding. So as we're reading through the law here, it's not the case that everything here is applicable to us, right? In fact, I would argue it would be immoral for us to take some things in here and just treat them as being applicable directly to us. Uh, an easy example is go and kill everybody in that land and take it from them, right? It would be immoral for us to take that and say, God is commanding me to go and take um, my promised land, wherever that is. That exact reading of Joshua in particular, and uh, I guess numbers by implication, was used in the, uh, the, the uh, expansion of the United States into the West, right? Taking this land from the, the heathens, right? Or the pagans. This was used by Europe, in, uh, by the Spaniards throughout South and Central America. So there, there's wrong ways of using the law here uh, where you're not actually paying attention to the actual command that God gives at the time to the people God gives it, but you're saying, well, yeah, if I take it, I can use it for myself in this way and actually accomplish lots of things for me. Um, but that's not actually what the law is there to do. Um, and so part of, as we continue reading this story, we're gonna see the way that the law functions for Israel um, and finally, the way that Jesus confirms the law, but also is going to uh, offer something outside of the law. Not something new. Faith exists beforehand, but uh, actually is going to be the culmination of another word from God that's not the law. Um, and so that's, you know, we're going to have, it's going to take us a while to get there, but that's what we're, that's part of what we're working towards as we read through this. Yeah. Uh, any other questions in our last five minutes? Yeah. 246. Yeah, he, Moses talks about um, vows and pledges. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So talk about vows and pledges yeah. here. Yeah. It's confusing to me because yeah. it was after God's instructions about offerings. Oh, this a vow or pledge different? What does that exactly You know, so that's a good question. So what is exactly a vow and a pledge and how is it different from an offering? I reminded you of becoming like a priest or a nun. So there's the, the Nazarite vow. Is that in this section? Or is that in another section that's talked about? Um, that might be in a different section. But like there's these vows. So uh, I don't have a really satisfying answer partly because we don't know specifically. But the, the idea I think would be um, somebody might say, like might I vow to uh, give this amount to the temple when I die, or I vow to uh, live in this kind of restricted way, which is the Nazarite vow, which is something like being a priest or a nun, or a monk or a nun, actually more, maybe something like that, that, uh, that they are, they're sort of making a promise to God as part of their piety, I guess you could say. We don't know what those are. They're not spelled out very well here, which probably means that the people don't need it to be explained to them. <laughs> it's just something that happens. Something that people, well, yeah, people always go and they uh, they take a vow uh, to do this and in exchange they ask for success in battle or success in farming or success in whatever. And if you do this, God, I will pay you back this way. Jacob speaks to God this way. Um, lots of people speak to God this way. It's, to me, I think it's something that's sort of culturally happening and here there's some regulations placed on what's culturally happening. Um, but we don't know specifically. Um, we're gonna hear, uh, I think it's Samson is a Nazarite. 
he takes it is his he's given as a Nazarite from birth uh, in the book of Judges. Uh, Samuel uh, in the book of Samuel is. Uh, is uh, something like a Nazarite as well, that um, he sort of takes a vow where he's serving in the temple. Samson's is weird. Samson's uh, is a, if you remember the story of Samson, he's very strong and if his hair gets cut, he loses his strength. The Nazarite vow, you're not supposed to cut your hair. Like there's a, yeah, until you're done with the vow and then you, then you shave it. Um, so that seems to be a connection there, but nowhere in the Nazarite vow does it say you'll have super strength or something if you do this. Well, the Samson story is a little strange, like it's sort of Nazarite, but also we'll see in the judges. The judges are strange. All of the judges are like a bit outside what you expect. Um, a way of putting it maybe is that the judges are not God's long-term intention uh, for, the, for the people. They're sort of extraordinary interventions of extraordinary times and in the story it's very clear they're not examples to follow most of them a couple of them are okay but for the most part samson for example eh, don't follow samson you know he ends up with his eyes gouged out and <laughs> pulling an, a pagan temple down on himself you know it's just not a it's not a good end you don't want to i don't recommend that way of life for anybody um yeah uh so any other any other questions so good yeah question about the vows yeah 271. Yeah, it talks about the Lord will keep you free from every disease if you do what you're supposed to do. Yeah. Which isn't accurate, right? I mean, so, hmm. so why is that in there? When you say it isn't accurate, what do you mean? Be a little more specific. Well, what I mean is, you know, if you follow it through, um, the Israelites, I don't think there's anywhere it says that they were free from disease ever. Well, neither did they follow it through. Well, <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. So there's these promises like if you obey the, you know, God will keep you free from disease. God will make your fruit uh, bear excessive harvest. We saw this in Leviticus in particular, um, and we'll see it again near the end of Deuteronomy. Um, these sort of rewards for following the covenant. And so, uh, I think in the language of the text, I would have to say these are promises of God, not to everybody, but to these people right now. And, and they're, not pro they're not unconditional promises. They're not gospel promises in the sense that we talk about God's promise. They are promises with conditions. If you do this, then this will be the result. If you don't do this, then this will be the result, right? Like uh, very much uh, we sometimes call the logic of the law. If, then logic. If this, then that. Um, and this would be a, a mistake would be to read this and say, okay, if I today do these things, I will be free of every disease. God has not made that promise to you, at least not that I'm aware of. God's not making that promise to you in Deuteronomy, right? God's making that promise to Israelites in Deuteronomy, uh, not, uh, not, not to you. So this is a part of also how do you read the law and apply it kind of faithfully today. So um, yeah, if they had, would they have? I think at least Deuteronomy assumes yes, it would have worked, that God would have uh, intervened for them. Um, but, uh, but they, they never do. <laughs> yeah. The other problem with this, uh, we'll see by the time of Jesus, uh, I think of John chapter nine in particular, this man, the story of the man born blind, um, and, uh, he's begging and Jesus and his disciples come by and the disciples say, all right, Jesus, we've got a question for you. This man was born blind. I don't know how they know that, but somehow they can tell this man was born blind. Who sinned? to make this man born blind? Was it his parents or was it him somehow in the womb? Did he somehow sin? Because the assumption is kind of out of this Deuteronomy reading, every disease will come from you not obeying the commandments of God, right? So any misfortune that comes must be because you did something wrong to deserve it. And even that's already, you know, this is 2000 years ago, that's already an irresponsible reading of Deuteronomy. That's not what Deuteronomy says here. Deuteronomy is speaking on a national level, not on a, you know, your uh, flu comes from your sin. Uh, you know, it's not God's punishing you individually. That can happen. It does happen in numbers sometimes, right? There are plagues for disobedience, but, um, but that's not, we can't just take that and read that into all of life. You know, everybody gets what they deserve all the time, something like that. Uh, in fact, the gospel, the existence, you look, how do all the apostles end up? They all end up badly, right? So, uh, you know, it's, it actually almost seems the opposite uh, when you look at the world. So, but good, that's a good question. I'm glad you asked that. All right, I think we're at the end of our time. Uh, we have one more week of, of the Pentateuch. We have one more week of the law 
understood as the five books of Moses. Uh, and uh, we are, so we end Deuteronomy this week. Uh, and so this, uh, I find Deuteronomy a little easier reading than some of the earlier law codes, but it's still kind of law code. And it's going to continue to be that this week. Next week, we get into Joshua, which is much easier to read for the most part, except the content is harder. So it's, we're back to stories, we're back to narrative, um, conquest narratives, but those questions about harem warfare, that Joshua is, that's what Joshua is about. Joshua is about the taking of the land. And so there's a lot to wrestle with in Joshua. So uh, we've got a couple weeks of uh, challenging weeks ahead of us in reading, I think. Uh, let me close this in prayer and then uh, we'll finish up. Gracious God, I thank you for uh, your faithfulness to us. Continue to open our minds uh, to hear your word, um, to appreciate uh, the law that you have given and the way it preserves life, but also the way in which it uh, does not lead to salvation. Tune our ears to hear uh, the voice of your gospel, to learn to trust in your promises, uh, and to uh, receive all of the good things you have for us in faith. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.